Good evening, Bible Baptist Church. We want to welcome you to church, and I invite you to sing with us, um, The Solid Rock. My hope is built on the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Wonderful. And then our next song is to be Greatest the Lord. Last week we sang about how awesome God is, how great He is. So I just want to continue that theme tonight with Greatest the Lord. Greatest the Lord, He is holy and just. By His power we trust in His love. Greatest the Lord, He is faithful and true. By His mercy He proves His love. time lift up your voice great is the lord he is holy and just by his power we trust in his love great is the lord he is faithful and true by his mercy he proves he is love sing it out great is the lord and How great God is, and then we just ought to give Him thanks. It's just the next, next thing that just feels right is He does all these things. We see His power. We see how awesome He is. We see how great the Lord is, and we just want to give thanks for everything that He's done. Uh, so join me in this chorus and just give thanks to Jesus. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to. because he's given Jesus Christ his son give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ 
Well, church family, it's good to be with you tonight, excited about the message in James 3, uh, thankful that we can gather together again and worship the Lord. And before we sing our last song for this evening, a couple of words of announcement, and then we will pray. Uh, just as a reminder, junior camp and senior camp, we are taking signups for those, so please, 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 if you want to be involved in those, sign up. You can do so at the info desk, or you can email the staff. Um, if you're interested and have questions about those, contact the Barons for senior camp and Jeremiah for junior camp. I know it'll be a great time. Uh, the kids always have a great time. They're always impacted with the Word of God. Uh, so reach out if you have questions, but otherwise sign up, and we will be moving forward on some of the details with those. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we are grateful, Lord, for what you have done for us. Lord, and as we sang a moment ago, we do want to give thanks to you. Uh, you've told us that is one of the marks of a spirit-filled believer that we would regularly give you thanks for all that you have done for us. Lord, we can't begin to catalog or describe the ways in which you have blessed us, Lord, from our salvation to the, the good gifts that you give us. Lord, every day you load us down with benefits. So, Lord, I pray that you would accept our gratitude. Lord, I pray that as we sing to you, it would be an offering that is well-pleasing to you. Lord, I pray that our hearts would be stirred uh, by the music and the message tonight, that we would be more like you. We're grateful for what you're going to do. In your name, amen. Awesome. And for our last song, we're going to be singing, Oh Great God. Um, but one thing that's really been sticking out to me is while we've been worshiping and gathering back together is just how the songs that we sing on Sunday morning and Sunday evening just go with you through the week. And that's truth easily transmitted into your life. Um, that you can remember easily. So I encourage you as we sing tonight and as we worship Jesus, that you would just take these songs, think about them, meditate on them, and just allow them to influence your life throughout the week. Um, let's sing, Oh Great God. Oh Great God of highest pray this prayer to God. Help me now to live a life that's dependent on your grace. Keep my heart and guard my soul from the evils that
Amen, church. Well, I hope you have enjoyed uh, singing together and gathering back together and getting to sing truth uh, to one another. I think one of the greatest benefits that we have of physically gathering is the ability to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So I hope that you will allow those songs to uh, soak into your mind and heart and you would rehearse them throughout the week. I think I will be pleased um, through whatever we are thinking about. Philippians 4, 8, one of the greatest ways to make sure we are living that out is by dwelling on things like the hymns that we sing in church. Well, James chapter number 3 is where we're going to be tonight. James chapter number 3. I want to jump right in and begin reading our text in verses 1 through 12. The Bible says this, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. And behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would help us tonight as we look at the power of the tongue and what it means, Lord, to use words that are pleasing to you. God, I pray that you would help each and every one of us in here to allow our speech to be controlled by your spirit. Lord, that we would use words that bring life rather than death, that build up rather than tear down, and that edify the people that we come in contact with. Lord, we love you. Be with me as I preach now in your name. Amen. Men. Immediately following chapter 2, and right on the heels of hammering home the truth uh, that real saving faith always expresses itself in works, James talks about the tongue and how we use our words. And the reason we grew right from chapter 2 to chapter number 3 is this. What comes out of us reveals what is going on inside of us. The clearest view of your heart is seen through the lens of your speech. That's why Jesus said when he was talking to the disciples, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We can look at it like this. If anger is coming out in your words, it's because anger is in your heart. If discontentment is coming out in your speech, it is because discontentment is rooted in your heart. And of all the topics addressed in the book of James, this might be the most practical every day. Each and every one of us, we have the opportunity to sin in how we communicate. Now, there's a lot of sins that you may never even have the chance to commit. If you're a single person, you're never going to have the chance to sin against a spouse. But when it comes to our words, each and every one of us, on a regular basis, is faced with the temptation to use our words wrongly. Now, this is not the first time that James addresses the issue of speech. In fact, Every chapter of the book, James hits on this very practical portion of the Christian life. We can kind of walk through the book in verse or chapter 1. He says, be slow to speak. He also reminds Christians that if any of you seem to be religious and yet you don't keep control of your tongue, your religion is vain. Chapter 2, he said, so speak and so do as those that shall be judged by the perfect law of liberty. Chapter 3, really the whole chapter deals with our words and our speech. Chapter number 4, he says, don't speak evil one of another and don't use your words to boast about what you're going to do, but rather you should say, if the Lord will. Chapter 5, he says, swear not. 
and confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. So this topic of speech runs all throughout the book of James. And coming back to chapter number three, I want to look tonight at the power of the tongue. And from these verses, I want to see four reasons that we need to watch our words. Number one is seen in verse number one and two, and that is this, the tongue can condemn. The tongue can condemn. James starts off by saying, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, this chapter begins with a warning for those who desire to teach. Be not many masters literally is saying, James, don't. A lot of you should not have this desire and hunger to teach. Why? Because there's going to be greater condemnation to those who stand up and proclaim the word of God. The word master in the Greek is didaskalos. Forty times it is used in the Gospels to refer to Jesus when the disciples called him master or teacher. It is this word that is used in chapter 3, verse number 1. Other times it was used of any rabbi who held a teaching or a preaching position in the synagogue. Now to be a rabbi or a didaskalos was a prestigious position. In Matthew 5, Jesus said that many people love to have that place of honor at the banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues, and they love to be called rabbi or teacher by men. And apparently this kind of uh, uh, thought process of honoring teachers and didaskalos and people who stood up and gave instruction had carried its way from Judaism into Christianity, and many people were desiring to have a position. They wanted to be the ones to stand up and teach others. They had a word and a message that they said, other people need to hear what I have to say. And we aren't told what was at the root of those desires. There's many reasons someone may have a desire to teach. It could be that God showed you something, and you want to share it. Teaching uh, has impacted you, and you want to make a difference in that way. It could be a more selfish reason. You may think that you could do a better job than the person that is currently teaching. You may think that you have wisdom, or you're proud, and you want your voice heard. And so you say, I, I want to teach, I want to preach, I want that position. Now, I've had visitors to our church, on the first time they've ever attended, come, after, come up to me after the service and ask me, how long do I have to attend before you will let me teach from the pulpit? They assumed that we we're just willing to let anybody stand up and teach as long as they expressed a desire. And he even told me, I have something that the people of this church need to hear. Now, what they probably needed at that moment was this warning from James. There is a greater condemnation and a stricter judgment for those who stand up and instruct others. Now, if you ever find yourself with this desire in your heart to preach or to teach or people need to hear me, I need to have my voice heard, it may very well be that God has placed that in you. So I don't want to pour water on that. I think that's good and you should foster that. And maybe it is that God would have you be somebody who publicly proclaims his word, but I would leave you with the warning that James has here. Make sure you go in with this knowledge. There is a stricter judgment for those who teach. Now, this verse is a door that leads us from the concept of faith and works in chapter 2 into a discussion about speech in chapter number 3. And I think he uses this, uh, this idea of teaching to bridge the gap because it shows us as teachers how easy it is for us to sin in our speech. Proverbs 10, 19 says, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin. And when you preach, or when you teach, or when you instruct, you are using a lot of words. Now, some of you are probably thinking right now, well, maybe you should just avoid that and use fewer words. We could go home earlier, you'd have less judgment, and we'd be kind of a win-win situation. I'm working on editing myself, but the reality is, each time I preach, I say a lot of things. I've got a word count on my document, and tonight, my document says that I have 3,000 887 words in my manuscript that I'm going to speak to you before this night is over. That is a lot of chances to say something wrong, hurtful, proud, selfish, foolish. That's a lot of chances to sin in my speech. And Jesus himself reminds us that we will all give account for every idle word that we speak. And for teachers, the judgment is even stricter. So I want to speak. Maybe you're a Sunday school teacher in this church. 
an Awana worker, a junior church leader. Maybe you you teach in a one-on-one setting in something like discipleship. Maybe you host a Bible study. For anyone who instructs others, we should feel this weight. That we're going to answer to God, not just for our words, but how we taught others with the words and the opportunities that he gave us. John Knox was a famous Scottish preacher. It is said that during his first sermon, he felt such a burden before getting up to the pulpit that he wept uncontrollably on the front pew until people had to come and console him and assure him that he could go up there and preach. But the weight was so great, they said he wept when he realized what an opportunity and privilege he had. Now, this message is not to discourage you from sharing God's word or tell you that only certain people can be teachers. All of God's children have a responsibility to share truth. But it is a warning of a weight of, about the weight of responsibility that it brings because our tongues can condemn us. Look at verse number two. James says, For in many things we offend all. Offend there means to stumble or to fall. In many ways we stumble. And if any man offend or stumble not in word, the same is a perfect man. And able also to bridle the whole body. You know, as fallen human beings, there is no shortage of ways for us to sin. We all fall short in more areas than we could ever begin to calculate. And our words are no exception. Our tongues can be used for gossip, for anger, for slander, for blasphemy, for lying and dishonesty, for criticism, for complaining and grumbling. We could go on and on and on. And James says, if you find somebody who doesn't sin with their words... You found a perfect person. Their whole body is able to be controlled if they can harness the power of the tongue. And I want you to think of right now what your greatest struggle is in self-discipline. Now, we all probably wrestle with wanting to do certain things and not doing them and not wanting to do other things and then ending up giving in to them. Maybe it's in an area of exercise. You know that you should exercise, and you tell yourself every week, okay, this is the week uh, I'm running or I'm walking or I'm doing something, and then the week goes by, and you think, man, I didn't do one single day of exercise. Maybe you have a lack of self-control around food, and if there are uh, chips in the house or chocolate, you know you're just going to eat it and eat it until it's gone, and you know you should stop, but it's just almost like you can't control yourself. Maybe it's something a little more serious. There's a sexual sin that consistently ensnares you, and you bring it to the altar, and you bring it before God, and you say, God, give me victory over this, and you find yourself returning to it over and over again addiction to substance, whatever it is, James says, if you could control your tongue, then every single area of struggle in your life would be a piece of cake. That's how difficult it is for us to control our tongues because our words show who we really are inside. And so James says our tongues can condemn us. The supreme act of self-control is the ability to control what we say. So why do we struggle so much? It's because, as I said, our words reveal our heart. You can draw a direct line from right here inside of you. You can draw a direct line to your tongues, and you can be assured if you are sinning with your mouth, it is because there is sin in your heart. Spiritual speech only comes from a spirit-controlled heart, and sinful speech only comes from a self-controlled heart. The ease and variety in which we sin with our words reveal that we are not as spiritual as we think. Every time we say something self-serving or boastful or critical or harsh, our words condemn us. Now, taking the the flow of the passage from verse 1 and the greater accountability of teachers and then the ease in which we sin, this brings a sobering reminder to anybody who preaches and teaches. It brings a type of fear to me as I stand up here before you. If James says it's so easy to sin that somebody who controls their tongue perfectly is a perfect man, then what I'm doing here is a serious matter. It's one of the reasons when I preach, I bring a manuscript with me because I'm going to give an account for every single word. So let me speak to everyone tonight. You will give an account for your words. One day you will stand before God and everything you said, typed, posted, writ, 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 writ out, wrote out, whatever you do to communicate in your speech, 
you're going to answer to God for that. That's a serious matter. Our words have the power to condemn us. So we need to watch what we say. Number two, we say, we see this in the passage. The tongue, not only can it condemn, but the tongue can control. Verses three and four, behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. James here, he gives an illustration from navigation and an illustration from nature. A small piece of rope, a, a little strap of leather can control the movement of an entire horse. Think of a giant cruise ship. Maybe you've been on a cruise before. These big, giant, floating hotels that house thousands and thousands of people, and yet, in comparison, a pretty small piece of metal directs the entire boat. Now, I'm not an equestrian. I am not a sailor. But I know the importance of having a bridle on a horse and a rudder on a ship. On a boat, you can do without a lot of things. You could do without, I'm assuming, a comfy captain's chair as you go out on the sea. You don't need a fancy sailor's scarf. You probably don't even need one of those cool gold telescopes to tell you what is in front of you. But if you don't have a rudder on your ship, it is going to be a long day at sea. And even though it may be pretty small in comparison to the rest of the boat, it is vital because it controls the direction of everything. Same for a bridle on a horse. It's been a long time since I've been horseback riding, but I know that I'm not getting on that mass. You just go ahead and do your thing and I'll hold on for the ride. No, I want something. I want a bridle to be able to direct the direction of where we are going. And James uses these pictures to get us thinking about the power of our tongues. Although it is a relatively small part of our body, it has the power to control our entire lives. Think about the way words control us. Relationships have ended because of hurtful words that were said. People have lost their jobs because of things they have written or typed or sent. Churches have been split apart and divided because of what somebody said. Our words have the power to direct us and turn us aside and control our whole lives, and so we need to be on guard. Proverbs 18, 7 says, A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Did you get that? His lips snare his soul. Something as small as our mouth controls our very soul. Words can build up or tear down. They can give life or take life. They can heal or wound. They can cause hope or fear. They can point people to God or away from God. And the reality is if you don't control your tongue, your tongue will end up controlling you. The tongue is a little member. Yet James says it boasteth great things. I probably don't have to tell you how powerful words can be. I imagine if we were to uh, go through testimony time tonight, each and every one of you could point to a time in your life when somebody said something hurtful to you. Maybe it's even years and years ago, and yet the wound has stuck with you. Maybe it was a coach or a teacher or, or a friend. Maybe it was a parent. They said something to you, and you carry the scars of that because words have power. Conversely, there may have been times when it seemed like nothing in life was going your way. You were discouraged, worn out, having a hard time, and yet a single word or note of encouragement from somebody gave you the encouragement to press on. So how are your words directing your life? Does your speech lead to godliness and flourishing and the good of others? Or is your speech controlling you and taking you down a path of sinfulness and selfishness and destruction? David Guzik said, if the tongue is like a bit in the mouth of a horse or the rudder on a ship, it leaves us with the question, who or what holds the reins? Who or what directs the rudder? Now, some people have no hand on the reins or rudder, and therefore they say whatever comes into mind. Others direct their tongue from their emotions or from aspects of their carnal nature. And James points us towards having the Spirit of God working through the new man set directing hands on the reins and rudder that is our tongue. 
both the beast and the boat, uh, the, the creature and the craft, controlled by small instruments in the same way our tongue controls us. Next, we see that the tongue, not only can it condemn and control, it can corrupt. The tongue can corrupt. Verse number five, behold, or verse number six, behold how great a f- matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. The largest a forest fire in California history started two years ago, and it burned over 410,000 acres of land. The ranch fire, as it is known, was started by a single hammer hitting a metal stake, and then with that blow, it caused one little spark to fly up, landed in some dry brush on July 27th, and the fire did not go out until November. million worth of damage was done, and it all started with a single spark. That's the way it is with our tongues. They have the power with a single word to destroy countless people and things and places. Listen to how James describes the tongue. It is a fire, a world of iniquity that defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. Let's just walk through what he says. He said it is a world of iniquity. If we travel back in time to Genesis chapter number 1, 2, and 3, we can go to the Garden of Eden when sin entered into the world for the first time. And you know how it started? It started with words from a serpent to Eve. Did God really say that you can't eat of this tree? The moment Adam was confronted after he had taken that fruit and he had chosen to sin and God came to him, do you know what he did? He used his tongue to blame his wife. And do you know what Eve did? She used her words to blame the serpent and to blame God. We could continue on. Their sons, Cain and Abel, as they are bringing their offerings to God and Cain is disappointed that God has not accepted his. He kills his brother Abel. And you know what the first words that are recorded of Cain in Scripture? He is sinning with his tongue and he's lying to God. Am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. We could go into the first civilization, the Tower of Babel. The first time humanity organized itself and what was their great sin? It is seen in their words. We will build a tower to the heavens. And you can trace all of scripture and probably even all of your life. Your sin is often manifested through the words that you say. It's a world of iniquity. It says it defiles the whole body. Every one of our sinful tendencies can be expressed in our words. Pride is seen in how we boast. Anger uses words to curse and yell and belittle. Bitterness turns our speech sour. Jealousy causes us to accuse. Discontentment shows itself in grumbling and complaining. Sinful speech contaminates every area of our life, and it is like smoke that permeates our clothes and hangs on to us and ruins whatever it touches. It defiles the whole body. Then it sets on fire the course of nature. It doesn't just defile you. Your speech destroys others. Words can destroy a family, a church, a reputation, a relationship. The psalmist said in Psalm 64, 3, that these people, they sharpen their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words. Uh, In the Old Testament, the rabbis would speak of the tongue as an arrow because it could kill from a distance. That's the way it is with our words. You don't even have to be near somebody, but you can do great damage with just a few sentences. Warren Wearsby noted that for every word in Hitler's Mein Kampf, 125 lives were lost in World War II. Words destroy. Maybe you've seen it in your relationships. A single thoughtless word or a hurtful comment can fracture a friendship or cause division in a marriage. It sets on fire the course of nature. Next, he says, it is set on fire of hell. Now, it's interesting, if you look at the Greek, James does not use the word Hades, which we often associate with hell. He says, it is set on fire of Gehenna. Now, Gehenna 
was an actual place on the south side of Jerusalem where people would bring their trash and their garbage for burning. And the Jewish audience would have immediately understood and had this vivid picture in their mind of this giant smoldering trash heap on the outskirts of town that sent up noxious fumes that you couldn't even get close to without struggling to breathe. James says, that is what your tongue can be like, constantly spewing out garbage and contaminated words. And just like fire feeds on itself and continues to expand and consume things, one wrong word that can start a blaze that will last for weeks and months and sometimes even years. I know people who have held a grudge for decades. And if you ask them what caused the problem, you know what they'll point to? Somebody who said something about them a long, long time ago. Words have the power to destroy. Proverbs 16, 27. In his lips is as a burning fire. Maybe we should all sing the kids' song tonight. Be careful, little lips, what you say. Now again, James is not telling us that we should never speak or that we should somehow avoid this by just uh, taking a vow of silence now, that might be easier than exercising true self-control over our tongue, but the bridle, the rudder, and the fire all remind us that they can do tremendous good when they're controlled and directed in the right way, and so it is with our words. It's not just that we need to be silent and never speak. No, we need to use our words correctly. When our words aren't controlled, they will con corrupt. And verses 7 and 8 give us more illustrations to get us thinking about our words. Verse 7, James says, For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. Now, I don't know exactly what they had in the first century as far as zoos and aquariums, but apparently, even back then, they had found a way to domesticate and tame and bring wild animals under their control. The Roman Colosseum was built in the 70s AD, which is uh, maybe two or three centuries after the book of James was written. And you can even go and see illustrations and drawings of, of gladiators fighting lions as the crowd watched. It was kind of a sport and entertainment where they would uh, capture these lions and bring them in to see a fight against a human. Before the fights with lions, they would often have animal hunts where they would bring in all sorts of animals that they had captured, and they would watch people hunt them and kill them, things as small as rabbits and goats and as big as elephants and hippopotamuses and bears. Now, we don't have the same level of violence, but we have zoos. You can go down to the zoo now and see animals that you wouldn't imagine. How in the world did people capture them, and yet there they are, tamed and in a cage. We've trained some of these animals to even do what we want. Pigeons can carry messages. Dogs can roll over and speak. Whales and dolphins will jump through hoops for a prize. Even the most dangerous animals have been tamed. I've got a picture here just because we could use a smile. It is a, a bear on a scooter in a circus. Now, this doesn't always go well, and you can find some videos where he's not looking quite as happy as he is right now, but there are places where you can go and see an actual bear riding a scooter with a hat on. Man has found a way to bring animals under his dominion. One of my favorite things is to watch snake charmers. You've got these snakes here, and with music and movement, these snakes will do almost be controlled by somebody. But verse 7 is just a setup, so James can drop the hammer in verse 8. All these things man control, birds, beasts, serpents, everything, but not the tongue. The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Unruly means that it is uncontrollable. How many of you have ever said something that you later regretted? Maybe you said it and you immediately regretted it as the words were leaving your mouth. Maybe you've left a conversation and thought, man, I really don't know why I said any of that. Our, our words, our tongues get away from us. Maybe you've heard the expression that somebody is always running their mouth. If you felt that phenomenon where you begin to speak and before you know it, you're saying things that it doesn't even seem like your brain is aware of. One more reason that I write out a sermon manuscript is I've tried to preach from an outline before, and you know what happens? I'll get halfway through a sentence and completely go blank on where I was intending to go, and then I'll just end up looking goofy up here for a little while until I figure out, and I'll just have to stop and start over again because 
Our words get away from us. David prayed in the Psalms, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, and keep the doors of my lips. The wisdom of James 1 is evident that we need to be slow to speak. And if you are someone who is quick to speak, you're free with your words, you're always offering your opinion, you always need to say something, you're always posting online, let me remind you to be careful because your tongue is unruly. You don't have as much control of it as you think you do. Next, he says, it is poisonous. Fire consumes from the outside in. Poison consumes from the inside out. And I think James is just trying to say it in as many ways as he can that words can kill. Romans 3.13, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit, and the poison of asps is under their lips. The tongue can corrupt. And lastly tonight, verses 9 through 12, the tongue reveals compromise in our lives. James says, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Now, if you'll note in verses 10 and 12, that James addresses these people twice as brethren. And it's a reminder that James is speaking to people that he believes are Christians. They are believers in Jesus Christ. And yet, it is obvious he is concerned about the way they are using their mouths. One moment, they are blessing God. And the next moment, their, their words are used for cursing. And it shows us that our tongue can reveal deep-seated inconsistency with our spiritual lives. We may believe down deep in our heart, yes, I'm a child of God and I want to honor him. And the next moment we can say something sinful and selfish and proud with our words. The same tongue is used for completely opposite purposes. This continues with a a theme of James. In chapter 1, we saw a double-minded man. In chapter 2, we saw a double standard through partiality. Here we see a double tongue. That one minute praises God, and the next minute curses others. Now, the main theme of James is that correct behavior flows from correct belief. So any deficiency in our actions is really rooted in what we believe. If you say, I'm struggling with this sin, the issue is not so much in your actions. The issue is far deeper in what you believe And so I think that's why in his instruction about the corrupting, destructive nature of words, James reminds us that every person is made in the image of God. The reason we are free with criticism, slander, accusation, gossip, is because we have a faulty anthropology. We have a wrong view of the doctrine of man we have failed to account for the reality that God is their creator. He has stamped his very image on their hearts and lives. And even if it is faint or twisted or marred, every single person that we speak ill of is made in the likeness of the God of the universe. And so to curse or speak against a fellow man is to curse something that has been created by the very hand of God. When you speak against your boss or your neighbor or your relative or your co-worker, do you realize that is a creation of God himself and you're speaking against something God has made? So we shouldn't come to church on Sunday and sing, Oh, great God, and then go home and complain about people who God made. You can't say amen to God so loved the world and then jump on Facebook to slam the the ignorant liberals or the foolish conservatives. You can't sit in the auditorium and pray to God and go out into the lobby and, and talk with anger and disdain about the media or the politicians or the neighbors or anybody. These things ought not so to be. Fresh water and salt water shouldn't come out of the same fountain. Fig trees shouldn't bear olive berries and vines shouldn't produce figs and sinful speech should not come out of a heart that's been regenerated by God. 
Unsurprisingly, this echoes the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, Jesus said, Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. What comes out of you reveals what is going on inside of you. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I would encourage you this week, maybe in your conversations at work, maybe in your conversations with your spouse, maybe you would just catalog every single thing that you share or post on Facebook and ask yourself, what is it that is coming out of me? Is it love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, or is it anger and complaining and bitterness and frustration and anxiety? Or am I revealing through my lips that my heart is right with God, or is there something far more serious going on? So what is the answer for all of this? This passage paints a bleak picture for us about our tongues. James says it's unruly, it's poisonous, it's destructive. No man can tame it. If we can wrangle our words, we are perfect in every way. This seems like an impossibility, and in our own strength it is. But the miracle of the Christian life is that we, if we have trusted in Jesus Christ, we are new creatures in him. And through the working of his spirit, we can have the fruit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. They can all be manifested even in our words. And as we close tonight, I don't think it's any coincidence that the, the book of Genesis is kind of lurking in the background in the discussion on speech in James chapter number 3, we can see the themes of, of the serpent. James talks about the dominion of man over animals, echoing what God told Adam to subdue the earth. We can see the imago Dei, man in God's image. We see the power of words. Genesis 1, God, what did he do? He spoke and life was created. He spoke and universes sprang forth. He spoke and the sun and the moon and the stars were brought out of nothing with just the words of God. Now you and I are not God and we cannot bring about supernatural life with our words, but our words can be used to build up. They can be used to give life and create hope and strengthen the weak and encourage the weary. And most of all, our words can be used to preach the gospel to sinners who need to be redeemed. So I want to leave us tonight with this encouragement. Your words can be used for completely destructive purposes. We've all probably experienced that. We've probably all been on, on the receiving end and the giving end of destructive words. But God wants to use our speech to preach the gospel to others, to minister to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, to, to speak things that edify and give grace to the hearers, so I would encourage you, church, tonight as we look at James 3, be warned about the power of the tongue, but be moved to use words that honor God and that bring good and edification to others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I'm grateful for the time that we've had tonight where it's been a convicting passage to think about the power of our words and what you want to do with our speech. God, I pray that you would help us as members of the church to use this week Lord, in every avenue that we have at our disposal, face-to-face -face conversations, phone calls, texts, emails, uh, Facebook and social media, we would use our speech and our words for your glory, that we would point others to you. We love you in your name. Amen. Well, church family, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. I pray that the message was an encouragement to you. I hope that it helps. Uh, just as a reminder, Wednesday night service will be live streamed at 7 p.m. Uh, we had a great start to a new series on the art of neighboring, and I hope that you were even maybe this week encouraged and challenged to go to get, get to know some of your neighbors, start building those relationships so that you can minister to them. We'll see you on Wednesday for that. Have a great week.